please welcome Dr. Mike Dorkin. Thank you, Dan, and uh, we'll uh, remain friends and collaborators uh, for as long as we're all here. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Peter Lackman. Uh, Peter is a, uh, was a pediatrician, a very effective pediatrician based at one of the world's leading uh, children's hospital in London, Great Ormond Street. Um, he was one of those lucky individuals, I think, uh, who was given the opportunity to spend uh, an immersive experience at IHI, um, um, as there are others in the room who have done the same, uh, the same journey. Uh, and he then came back from uh, the year in Boston and other parts of the US and, and set about uh, putting his uh, learning into practice. Uh, and what Peter has done since then is transform uh, many systems, both in, in uh, our own country in the UK, but also increasingly uh, in his travels uh, around the world. Uh, he's published uh, widely in the field, but also written some and edited some fantastic textbooks. Um, and I know we, we're all told not to read textbooks anymore. We need to read our, our Kindles, but uh, these books are absolutely fantastic. Um, so I'd recommend them to you. Uh, and if you ever see Peter's Lackman's on, uh, look, pick it up and read it. Uh, they're wonderful. Um, what he's also done for the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, though, is lead... Uh, our fellowship program. Now, you're going to meet some of the fellows later on, and I have no idea what Peter's going to say now and what he's going to be talking about, but I just want you to hold the fact that he has been single-handedly leading a faculty uh, of experts to help and support uh, our overseas fellows uh, from all parts of the world. So can you please welcome to the stage Dr. Peter Lackman. Thank you. Please welcome Dr. Peter Lackman. Hi, everyone. The mic on? Yeah. So um, it's a great privilege to be here and thanks for having me. Um, before I start the slides, uh, I want to pay tribute to, to Mike Durkin, to Joe, uh, for coming up this idea and saying to you, do you know anyone who wants to help us in the fellowship program? And they're really saying, do you want to? <laughs> and so um, I've been a pediatrician for 35 years. And I've worked, I was fortunate to say, to work at Great Ormond Street, where I led the program uh, after coming back from IHI. I was one of the fortunate ones to be at IHI. And my idea is that a person like myself, who's kind of post-retirement, it's a time of giving back all that I know. And this is the program I'm going to talk about, it's about giving back. Uh, we've heard sad stories today very moves, moving stories. But I want to show you what can be done if we look forward to the future. And so this is the future. So it's asked for learning objectives because we're at a university, so these are the learning objectives. But no one else has given them, so I'm the only one who comply. <laughs> it quite shows you. Uh, so if people remember that the Earth's human was the starting point, really, the gun that really shot off that came out at the turn of the century. But really, it was that the two reports from LEAP uh, uh, reviews are saying that we harm people in healthcare. Of course, uh, when I, I, I saw the Hippocratic Oath, the more simple one, first to no harm. But we had no idea what harm is. But my story was that uh, I experienced the same kind of experience that Don Spire uh, spoke about with the exchange transfusion. But we've come a long way. In 2018, people forget about these two reports. As you refer to one yesterday, uh, that these reports came out in 2018, and they've forgotten already. I mean, because COVID came and no one's taken any notice of them. So Ezekiel spoke about the Lancet Commission with Margaret Crook, that's in the centre, the Health uh, World Health Organization on how to improve care, and crossing the global quality chasm, which showed eight million deaths. Uh, so from poor quality care. Uh, I really recommend that you look at these, but they've forgotten because COVID came along and then people tend to forget the past very quickly. But we can celebrate something. Here are two publications. 
First is the World Patient Safety Plan, Global Patient Safety Plan, which is the textbook plan from the WHO. I know I'm in the USA who don't really participate in the WHO like many other countries do in a different way. They've got a different relationship. But this is what one is the template for member states to follow when they're developing their patient safety plan. It's a fantastic document and uh, really looking, uh, looking at it well. But if you want to know the history of patient safety, you can read Making Healthcare Safe by Lucien Leap, which is the history of patient safety. And Lucien Leap is really the godfather of patient safety, I guess. So it's really right looking at that book. And then Mike was working on this one that came out uh, in December last year, already looking at this website from um, at Imperial College, which showed you the global state of patient safety worldwide. Again, I recommend you go to that website. It's continually been updated, and it shows you what is the current state of patient safety worldwide. So we've done it really well. So we should already be very pleased. But however, as you know, we've still got a long way to go. We've got a long, long way to go. This is like, I'm a, I was a child developmentalist, so we're still at toddler stage. <laughs> we not even, haven't even reached adolescence. We're still at toddler stage. So, but we've come a long way because of course toddlers have come a long way from when we were babies. So this is what the problem is from my perspective. Where we have come a long way is that we know what to do. But the problem is we do not know how to implement what we know at scale. So there are many, many examples of good quality improvement projects, patient safety, and you hear them, you've heard them. But at scale, very few. And that's where we have failed. It's a failure to match improvement science and patient safety science with implementation science. And that's what we have to think we have to do differently. So there are structural issues that you've heard about. The first is the one of culture, which is based on tradition and hierarchies. And uh, our hierarchies are medical. So even within medical structure, there are hierarchies. So the highest are the, well, they fight it out, the cardiothoracic surgeons and the neurosurgeons and the cardiologists. And you can see this in the payment system. They get paid far more than the community doctors. And then there's a, all the different sub-professions, hierarchies. You know, you need hierarchy, but they're rigid. And they're hierarchies throughout the world, in every system. And of course, there's traditions. You do need these traditions, but you don't need them all. Then there's context, and the complexity and design. And then files and the resources. People always say they don't enough. And I, I do work in, for example, in Sudan and Mozambique, and they say, uh, we don't have resources. I say, I believe you. And I come to the USA and they say, we don't have resources. And I say, I don't believe you. Can you see? If you speak to the fellows later, they come from countries where they don't have resources, but they manage to get safer care. And then finally, there's the problem of knowledge. And you've heard this, of lack of knowledge and theory of method. So one of the things we really believe in is that if you want to implement change, you have to have leadership for patient safety. And so this program is designed to deliver leadership, and I'm going to show you how the structure, and I've been continually evolving it with the help of the fellows. So the fellowship program started during COVID. That's when I got the tap on the shoulder from Mike. And I really like to do it because one of my things is developing young doctors and nurses and pharmacists, et cetera, who are on the program. And its components are threefold, theory and method, reflective practice, and action. So that's what we try to teach them. So these are the learnings, four levels of learning. The first is starting off not with patient safety, but starting off the multidimensional model of quality, which I developed with Paul Batalden, which looks at the different domains of quality, bringing the different systems, we bring that in. Co-production, you heard that earlier. Nothing for me, 
without me. Doing it with and by me. You heard those words earlier. And that's the ladder. Reflect. Most of your health care is at the bottom of the ladder. And so we teach that right at the beginning that if you want to have patient safety, you have to co-produce it. And finally, you heard about the equity issues. So this is even before we start talking about patient safety. The first two sessions are on these two. So that's really setting the scene for what a leader has to do. Then we start talking about leadership for patient safety. And we go through the theories of profound knowledge that's stemming on how to affect change, how to care for the well-being of the healthcare providers, and how to lead for patient safety. And I've given you some of the theories we use, like the RAMS trilogy, uh, the American Academy's um, um, patient safety uh, leadership structures, the WHO. And there you also can see a very good thing for the same thing. We mentioned the second victim. I also work with the second victim program in Europe, and I really suggest people do this course. Because if you do not care for the healthcare worker, you cannot be safe. And I could put in the rooms for all the physicians in the rooms. How many of you have been second victims? If I asked you to put up your hands, I guess everyone would put up their hands. Or some would be too, maybe you shouldn't be too shy to put it up because here we go, you know, second victims. Put up your hands. And how many of you received, keep your hands up. How many have received good care afterwards? You see? The thing is, so it's very important. So the next session is on second victims, actually. Learning three, we teach them the theories of patient safety. A series of patient safety of reliability, human factors, proactive risk management, those are the different theories we use. Incident management, resilience, etc. complexity, measurement. So they're getting the theories. The fourth area is we teach them reflective practice. These are the two models we use. They can use any model, but reflective practice is something missing in our training. How did I act today with my colleagues? How did I act today with the people who saw me, who we call patients? Did I treat them correctly? If not, why not? What should I do differently? And that's something missing in healthcare. So they're learning all about that. But really, in the last four minutes, let's look at their own words. This is from Anal Yunus. She's quite a senior person from Iraq uh, in blood transfusion service. I'm not reading that. You can read her words. And this is a very senior person in Iraqi health service. This is from Elizabeth Igaga. Uh, you can read her words. Uh, she comes from, from uh, um, actually, I've made a mistake. She comes from Uganda not from Kenya. And, um, and so she talks about uh, how it's made a big difference in implementing her program. I've had, um, just to say, I was looking out, we've had fellows from Mexico, Brazil, Uganda, Kenya, Nigeria, Liberia, Jordan, Saudi, um, Lebanon, Philippines, Pakistan, Australia, United Kingdom, Latvia. So that's how the breadth that we're going on. I believe this fellowship is transforming and building my capacity as a leader by enhancing my understanding on different theories of systems thinking, complex adaptive systems, empowering me to lead diverse healthcare teams and drive meaningful improvements in patient safety. Hello, I am Maisa Jafar. It was a great honor to be part of this year's fellowship program in patient safety. The experience was very enriching and empowering. The fellowship program deepened my expertise in the field of patient safety. It also enhanced my system thinking skills. In addition to that, it was a great opportunity to network with experts in the field, providing fresh perspectives and more learning opportunities. Thank you. The fellowship program is equipping me with deeper understanding of patient-centered approaches and enhancing my abilities to prioritize patient needs in decision making. It is also strengthening my capabilities in leadership, developing a strategic thinking, management, and developing a policy documents. Though a focus on quality of care and patient safety, the fellowship prepares me 
to implement system to reduce the error and promote high standards of care across the globe. The fellowship will change me as a leader by being more reflective and bringing patients and their family in care planning as that is what we are trying to do when we say achieving zero patient harm. The fellowship is transformative. This is in one word, transformative. The fellowship in one word is inspirational. So my belief is that you heard of all the things that are wrong, but if you want to get things right, we have to develop the future leaders around the world. And that is where our efforts need to go. And there are many of us here who have been leaders. And the challenge to you all is how can you develop new leaders for the new generation? So this program has become incredibly successful. We interviewing later this week. Uh, we advertise for it on the WHO uh, GP net. And we had, over, I don't know, Shanaz will tell me, but over 100, or maybe 150 applicants. And we're taking 10. And the challenge is now for Joe and the team is how can we scale this up? So that's not dependent on me. So we can have a number of ongoing fellowship programs. I met with the fellows after, after at lunchtime to see how we can make this growing fellowship. So fellowship is not a one year program. It's a lifetime program. So join us in helping make this great. Thanks very much.